Welcome, Orchid Ninjas. And I say that because today we're dealing with the samurai orchid from Japan. And that is where the ninjas come from. And today, with my Neophenicia falcata, the other ninjas that will be in the description below that are also going to talk about how they care for their Neophenicia falcata are Fernanda Nascimento, Orchids and Succulents, Nicole Diana, and Lynn Smith. So these Neophenicia falcatas will be in the description below. More ninja orchids to watch down there. <laughs> I'm glad I could make that little bit of a segue there from my samurai to my ninjas. Thank you very, very much for joining in on this care collab. Thank you very, very much for clicking on the video and having a look-see at who does what where. As you can see, my Neo Venetia is in a setup of Lekka, but not only Lekka. Underneath is a dome of Ceramis. And this has been her setup since summer of 2020. We are now in February 21, and she has never skipped a beat. This orchid used to be in the traditional setup, not in the pretty traditional pot, but I had her wrapped in sphagnum moss for the longest time, and I would have to change that sphagnum moss out two times per year simply because of how much water this orchid needs during my very, very hot, dry summers. And the sphagnum moss would go nasty and disgusting. And then I just thought, no. The intervention of the second time of year would always fall during the hot months of June, July and August. And that is not when I want to be messing with my orchid roots, no matter what I do. Sometimes the orchid requires it because of that's when the roots are growing and most active. But in this case, simply because the sphagnum moss is breaking down and how much I had to water her to keep her happy while she was getting bigger and bigger, that is not why I want to be messing with my orchids. So I switched her up. There is a dome, massive dome of ceramus, and then I filled around with Lekka because in future I just want her to be happy with Lekka and anything that I put in to the pot, I made sure that the drier, drier atmosphere on the roots that were aerial is touching the Lekka. The really, really saturated roots of the sphagnum moss, they are embedded in ceramis. And again, she never missed a beat. She is growing super well. She was pot bound within a couple of weeks even. And I'm really, really grateful because again, I don't like to mess with orchids in the middle of summer unless they've got active root growth. And she was not growing actively in August. They do take a little bit of a rest. When it gets too hot, the heat will stress them out. So that's when they sort of go, yeah, mm, not having it. And then they start to pick up pace again in the fall, which is a little bit like, that's weird because we're normally used to our plants doing what they do during the warm months. But when the heat comes, then there is also a form of stress and they tend to slow down or shut down and wait until such a time as the temperatures are a little bit more conducive to what they like, which is actually, they can take it really, really cold. From the moment I got her, she's been growing outside in my climate. Even this year, uh, my temperatures in winter dropped to four degrees Celsius. That was a first, I've never seen anything below five and that's very rare. We never missed a beat. She's fine, she's doing well. She's on the south shelf of my blooming alley. And I apologize for any background noise you hear right now. It's a beautiful day outside and everybody is, seems to be needing to do something with their gardening equipment. I will try and filter that out. But she is in the south shelf of my blooming alley. In the summer, always in bright, bright shade. They do prefer to be like more, you know, like a low light. They don't want to be in direct sun. And I have a lot of light. I'm blessed. I'm in Southern Spain. I have a lot of light that sometimes protecting some of the orchids that don't like it that bright becomes the challenge as opposed to the other way around. So she is behind a white curtain and in bright shade all the time. And in the winter, same thing. In the winter, the only difference is that the angle of the sun changes 
and can hit her directly and then she gets some direct sun during the winter. But that's not me making it happen. That's just nature doing its thing and that's where she lives. So in the winter when it's not as hot, she does get some direct sun as you can see by some of the little freckles here on the leaves. She's getting plenty of light. I'm hoping that I get to see her blooms again come around June. Mine always blooms a little bit later, despite the fact I see many on, on the internet and they are already blooming and mine hasn't even spiked yet. But you know, if you have something that lives outside until it gets its mojo going and registers that the temperatures are now warmer and steadier and are conducive to growth, she'll flush out and push more growth before she can actually think of spiking. That is the one of the things about growing these guys outside. Indoors, I'm sure it's a completely different ball game because they have a more steady environment. But yeah, I have to say that I'm very, very pleased. This setup is working really, really well. The orchid is looking healthy. Some of the new leaves are starting to push out beautifully. I'm getting a couple of new little fans here and here. And yeah, fun fact, fun fact. Here's something I can provide it because a lot of times they are called furan. This is not a fukiran, this is a furan, because it's a wind orchid. So ran is orchid in Japanese, and then the fu with a W is the wind. If you see also fukiran, that would mean a rich and noble orchid. But that is when you get into these, or these neos that are a little bit more fancy and they have attributes with their leaves, the coloring, the mottling, the variegations, the size of the orchid, the shape of the leaves, fleshy, not fleshy, bean, not bean, all of that. The more intricate a neo becomes, then it is a fukiran. And everybody really says it's a neo finisha falcata, but yes, this is a classic falcata. It is not a kibana, it's not a gojo fukurin. There's nothing, let's say, special in adverted commas from a Japanese sense on this orchid. So this one is actually only a furan. I have others that would be fukiran because they are more fancy in their foliage. But this one, to my understanding, is a furan, which for me is great because I get a lot of hot, dry winds. So wind orchid, yep, you're welcome, I'll take you. Having said that, in order to meet its growing needs and its watering requirements, I had to take it out of that traditional Japanese setup and put it into something that I can actually accommodate and make it thrive as opposed to me chasing it down with a lot of watering and then having to change moss constantly. It's working beautifully. We shall see come the time for blooming, whether that is the case as well, as opposed to just vegetative growth. But as far as I'm concerned, if she doesn't do something radical, I'm quite happy to leave her in the spot for another two years and the roots will eventually grow out and over the pot. That is also the plan. I don't mind that. That's how they grow when they're in their original Japanese setup. And then hopefully I get to appreciate root tips again because that's another novel thing about these orchids. If you get the ones that are highly prized, the color of the root tips is important. In my setup, you can't see them. But once the roots grow out and over the fans and come out spilling out over the pot, well, then I'll be able to see root tips again. And that is what I'm aiming for at this point in time. In the meantime, I'm so happy that she's doing well. At this point in time, she's starting her vegetative growth. It's clear to see. I have started applying fertilizer of 160 parts per million every time the reservoir is empty. And then I flush her through twice using the outer mask as a measure. Flush her through twice with plain RO water and then refill the reservoir at this point in time, this time of year, with 160 parts per million. As the temperatures steady out and the nights aren't that cold anymore and she really starts to wake up properly, I will then go up to 300 parts per million for about six months of the year before the fall nights become too cold for her to actually be growing actively anymore. And you can see that by the color of the leaves, how the leaves change. A couple of weeks ago, she looked a little bit matte, a little bit dull. She didn't look like, you know, bright, shiny and glossy. And suddenly, in the last week, we've had some really nice mild temperatures. It was amazing. And you can see how there's a sheen coming back. They're glossy again. Even the leaves that were really matte, the old ones, they're coming alive again. 
So I do keep her a little bit on the drier side in winter, but I don't let her go dry completely. I do not let my microfibers dry out in the reservoir. There's always, always, I always, always aim, if I can, to have my microfibers wet. And my reservoir has enough water now in it to accommodate what she's absorbing while she's taking advantage of these warmer temperatures. The reservoir is not full completely. I don't like to do that. And that is how I keep her drier. I only fill the reservoir like to half. That's sort of my method of making sure that she's not sitting in something cold and wet while the temperatures are so cold. The weeks that we had in the winter that had dropped so low to four degrees, I did empty the reservoir out, even though she might have been a bit damp on the interior, but I'd emptied the reservoir out. You see, the thing is that where they come from, they actually can be in zero degrees and are known to have snow on them. Well, snow will melt and it's cold and then you, the roots will get cold. So I wasn't concerned about any of that wet stuff, damp stuff in the pot based on the fact that in nature, same thing would happen except it would be snow melt. I know this is not the conventional thing you would see on a Neo Phoenicia falcata, but I hope that it helped. If you were considering to do something similar with yours, in case you couldn't keep up with its care under a traditional setup, maybe this could be an option for you too. Ask away in the comments below if there's any additional information that I did not cover, but that you would be interested in. Alternatively as well, there are more videos in the description below from Fernanda Nacimiento, Nicole Diana, and from Lynn Smith, who has a massive collection of Neos. And I hope that all these videos combined will help you out in growing this orchid or make the decision for buying this orchid. Personally, I love it. It doesn't take up much shelf space and each fan will produce one or two spikes. So there's plenty of blooms. They are highly fragrant at night. What's not to love about that? A lemon, citrus, beautiful, beautiful, elegant fragrance. And they last about three weeks. I would say this one is an absolute keeper and I'm so, so pleased it's doing well in this setup for me here in Southern Spain. Now on another note, if you happen to have this orchid and you're watching this video and you do videos and you upload to YouTube or elsewhere, please consider joining on the Care Collab initiative for any further updates that we do on this orchid, contact me or any of the other channels in the description below. I have my email. Let us know, let me know if you want to be interested and I will definitely put you into that column for future updates and then shoot out to everybody else that you are on board. It's as simple as that and then one day we will coordinate a date and then we'll see her again someday. Maybe in bloom, maybe in spike. It all remains to be seen, but please feel free to join us on this initiative. Thank you so, so much for watching. Really appreciate your time. Take good care and stay safe. Bye.